Morning, I'm Gail Brewer, and I have laryngitis, but I'll do the best I can. It's getting better. I'm a chair of the Committee on Technology and Government, and I'm delighted that we're all here. I'm going to start with a uh, PowerPoint introduction, and then I'm going to thank the many people who are making this uh, hearing possible. So let's just start. Thanks to Colleen Patchter with the Committee on Technology and Government. This is an oversight hearing establishing strong network neutrality principles in order to protect the internet. And we have a proposed resolution, 712A, and for those who are concerned, there's always room to make changes. Um, as you know, the internet was created to be an open network that gives consumers choices over internet activities. It was designed as an end-to-end -end network that passes information between the end users without interference from the network provider. As you all know, Internet Protocol, or IP, also emerged with the design of the net as a way to separate the network providers from the services that run on the net. Forty years ago, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, decided that companies providing communication services could not interfere with or discriminate against information services. In 2002, the FCC tried to take away these non-discrimination protections, and the decision eventually ended up at the Supreme Court in 2005 in the case of NCTA v. Brand X, which you're all familiar with. After the court ruled in favor of the FCC, giving them the authority to make decisions and rules for broadband internet lines, the commission leveled the playing field for telephone and cable companies by deregulating internet services. Network neutrality has been defined as the principle that internet users should be able to access any web content they choose and use any applications they choose without restrictions or limitations imposed by their internet service provider. Recently, companies that provide internet access have been considering, haven't done it, turning away from this network neutrality rule and embracing a tiered access approach where websites that pay extra to providers would load faster than others. I guess kind of like the US Postal versus FedEx. Net telecom executives believe that a new payment program would help the companies invest in more bandwidth in order to improve download speeds for customers. Opponents to the tiered approach believe that the payment plan would hurt competition by discriminating against those smaller companies who cannot compete with the bigger firms. Discrimination, we feel, would also hurt innovation, which is considered to be key to the internet. In 2005, the FCC adopted a policy statement that outlined four principles to preserve and promote the open and interconnected nature of the Internet, but they do not carry any enforcement power. More recently, in October 2009, the FCC voted to move forward with the process of codifying rules by seeking public input on six proposed principles that apply to all platforms for broadband Internet access including wireless networks. And then in July 2009, Congressman Markey from Massachusetts and Eshoo from California introduced the Internet Freedom Preservation Act of 2009, H.R. 3458. This act seeks to set policies regarding the Internet and mandates that Internet access service providers, quote, not provide or sell to any content, not or sell any content application or service provider any offering that prioritizes traffic over that of any other such providers, close quote. And then in October 09, Senator McCain introduced the Internet Freedom Act of 2009, Senate 1836, which blocks the FCC from proposing, promulgating, or issuing any regulations regarding the net. Our resolution number 712A argues that network neutrality promotes competition and innovation among internet service and content providers. It advocates that Congress pass HR 3458 and that the FCC create enforceable protections for network neutrality in order to ensure that the internet will continue to foster innovation 
increase competition and spur economic growth. This resolution differs from the original resolution. We had a hearing uh, about a year and a half ago by removing references to outdated congressional bills and adding references to HR 3458 and S 1836, which are before the Congress, while also including the current actions by the FCC. So that's the uh, discussion that's going to take place today. Uh, before I go forward, I want to say a couple of things. We have an amazing array of people who've put this hearing together, um, obviously led by not only um, Colleen, but also Jeff Baker, who's counsel to the committee, and from our office, Kunal Mahatra, Lauren Klein, Sam Wong, Sophia uh, Guri, and Monica Landrove, and of course, uh, the fact is that the IT office of the City Council, led by Chris Law, has been very helpful. Eunuch Ortiz from the Speaker's office and the indomitable uh, Jolie McPhee from the um, Internet Society. Um, Sam will talk to you a minute about how he is tweeting and where you should find it, but because of all the wires, go that way, because otherwise you'll trip over them. Sam, would you just talk for a minute about what you're doing? Sure. Um, so in order to make this conversation more dynamic, we're using Twitter. Um, so if you have your laptop, feel free to uh, use the wireless internet um, with the codes up there on the PowerPoint. And uh, the Twitter account is at N-Y-C-C-T-E-C-H-C-O-M-M. -C -C -M. Um, you can also pick up a slip from the Sergeant Arms right there. Um, and then if you're tweeting, please use the tag code um, net neutrality as one word, and also pound rezo, R-E-S-O, 712A. And um, you, know, you can also send, submit your questions and annual comments to the committee via email at nyccteccom at gmail.com. All right. All right, thank you very much. Our first panel um, is uh, Fred Wilson from Union Square Ventures. Um, Art Brodsky from Public Knowledge, and Timothy Carr from Free Press. Um, come join us here at the table. Don't trip over anything. And uh, we'll set the clock at three minutes, but you can certainly go over a bit if you want. Whomever would like to start, go right ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Try that again. Hello. Great. Hi, everybody. My name is Fred Wilson, and I am an investor in technology companies. We, I have a firm with two partners called Union Square Ventures. And before that, I had another venture capital firm called Flatiron Partners. I've been investing in technology companies here in New York City for almost 25 years. Uh, I got my start in the business in the mid-80s. And the interesting thing to me about this hearing is the impact of the internet on New York City's economy I think is important and growing more important every day. When I first got in the venture business in the mid 80s, we used to fly to Silicon Valley in Boston to invest in companies. When I started my first venture capital firm in, in the mid 90s, about half of our investments were in New York, but the other half of our investments were in other parts of the country. At Unisquare Ventures, 20 out of our, maybe 22 out of our 30 investments are here in New York City. And the reason for that is that New York City has a very vibrant startup culture. And that reason for that is the internet. And the reason that the internet is empowered such a vibrant startup culture is that it is possible, without asking anybody's permission, to connect a server to the internet and develop a business on the internet. That's the way the internet has always worked. It's the open architecture of the internet. And it's a very powerful force for innovation. And the issue around net neutrality is simply that we cannot allow anybody in the internet ecosystem to ask for permission from a developer to build a website. And that, in effect, is what the infrastructure providers would like to do. 
They would like to control what applications run on their networks. They would like entrepreneurs to come to them, pay them for the right to run those applications. And that's the way it's worked in the mobile phone business until Apple has started to make some changes and I think we will see Android make even more changes. I think mobile, the mobile ecosystem is starting to look more and more like the internet ecosystem but it's not yet today quite there. And if you look at the number of applications that have been built for the internet versus the number of applications that have been built for other technology platforms, it's not one order of magnitude, it's like three or four orders of magnitude. The internet is a completely open playing field where anybody can build anything they want. <coughs> and that is why we have companies in this country like Google and Amazon and eBay that are hugely successful, powerful, global businesses. And we're starting to create some of those here in New York. And it's important, I think, for the government here in New York to support this ecosystem, both by doing things locally that can help these companies succeed, but also by speaking broadly out for a maintaining the existing architecture of the internet and not allowing anybody to dictate what can or cannot be run on an internet-based network. And ideally, it would be great if we could create the same architecture for the mobile internet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Whoever would like to go next. Good morning. Uh, my name is Art Brodsky. I'm with Public Knowledge, and I want to thank the committee for allowing an out-of-towner to come up and participate in your proceedings this morning. It's a lot of fun to be up in New York. I sort of never missed a chance to come up. Um, what I'd like to do is two things this morning. One, to, uh, to second what Fred said, because what this council could do is vitally important to the city of New York for the economy. It's important to all the internet users. It's important to all the internet developers to have an open, vibrant, and non-discriminatory internet. And to the extent that you can influence the Congress of the United States through your voice up here in this committee and the council as a whole, you'll make a very good contribution to preserving that open environment, which is so important. I'd like to tell you a little story um, about a news story I have from my, my local hometown paper. Um, it's called Using the Web to Adjust the Color on TV. And this is about a fellow named Jonathan Moore who runs a website called RowdyOrbit.com. And what he does is put African American and Latino and other content online. This is an illustration of a little um, web series called Chick, where a black woman decided she wanted to be a superhero. And so she made herself a little series of movies, and Jonathan put it online. So I talked with Jonathan the other day before I came up here, and he said, Art, I'm totally down with net neutrality because without net neutrality he couldn't get his content out. His actresses and the people that do all the things for his site couldn't get their content out. And that's why this is so important. It's not for the Amazons, for the Googles, for the cable companies. It's for the people who want to create and who want to build businesses and who want to sustain the open and non-discriminatory internet. And it's for the users who don't want to be caught in the middle of a power struggle between content providers who may find themselves in the slow lane because they can't afford protection money for the fast lane and the big infrastructure providers, the telephone and the cable companies. So my last bit this morning is just to say don't be distracted. You'll hear a lot of things about the need, about the threats to the economy from net neutrality. You hear a lot of probably some engineering mumbo jumbo about how you can't have a non-discriminatory internet. The jobs issue is a, is a red herring. I mean, I just read this morning that uh, Verizon is laying off another 8,000 people. In addition to the 8,000 they already laid off this year. It has nothing to do with net neutrality. Companies do what they do when they want to do it. And the networks are very good at being managed. They can be managed in a net neutral environment. All net neutrality means is you can't play favorites. That's my simple and easy message for you this morning. Thank you again. Thank you, and we will put your entire testimony into the public record. Thanks. Next. Thank you. Um, I'm Tim Carr. I'm the campaign director for Free Press. Um, we're really grateful for this opportunity to testify again on behalf of a net neutrality resolution in New York City. We hope uh, the city will set an example for others to follow. Um, there's, when we first heard about this hearing, um, 
we talked amongst uh, some of my colleagues and we decided to ask our activists in New York City whether they thought this was an important proceeding. So on Tuesday, we went out and asked them to sign on to a letter encouraging uh, the New York City Council to pass this resolution. In the last little over 48 hours, there have been 4,200 signatures on that, all from New Yorkers. A copy has also gone to our 13 members of Congress in the House, and I'm submitting a copy to you today. So you'll see a great deal of passion today around the issue, because much is at stake for the tens of millions of Americans who rely upon the internet every day. Despite the debate, I don't believe anyone on this panel or in this room would dispute two notions. First, over the past 40 years, the internet has emerged as an unprecedented tool for spreading innovative ideas, increasing public participation in our democracy, fostering economic opportunity even in the most overlooked communities. Second, I don't believe we would disagree that we need sound public policies to encourage faster, more open and affordable internet access for everyone in the country. The right policies will continue to advance the most democratic communications technology ever devised. The wrong policies will jeopardize this openness and hasten the global decline of U.S. broadband services. We need to pass the right policies right now. A lot has changed since I testified before you on net neutrality in 2007. We now have a president who has repeatedly pledged to take a backseat to no one in his commitment to net neutrality. President Obama has appointed a, the principal architect of his net neutrality agenda, Julius Janikowski, Janikowski to head the FCC. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Commerce Committee Chair Henry Waxman have all been outspoken in support of the FCC's efforts to pass a strong net neutrality rule. And perhaps most importantly, more than 1.6 million people across the country have contacted their elected representatives, urging them to support net neutrality. Unfortunately, though, a lot has stayed the same in the last two and a half years. In the first three quarters of 2009, ATT, Comcast, Verizon, and their trade groups have spent nearly $75 million and hired more than 500 lobbyists to discredit an open internet. And that's just the money we know. They have also funneled untold sums to phony front groups, think tanks, and populist-sounding PR campaigns. As we've seen with the healthcare and global warming debate, any effort at reform will come under a relentless assault from deep-pocketed institutions that prefer the status quo. The money against net neutrality is being spent to lock in incumbent control in America. The present phone and cable duopoly provides 97% of fixed broadband connections into American homes. More and more users are starting to use these connections to create and share media. And in response, these same companies have moved rapidly to reverse engineer the openness that's the hallmark of the internet. The history, however, is clear. And you, you've gone over it much already, but I think it's important to note that the internet was born in a regulatory climate that guaranteed, guaranteed strict non-discrimination. Internet pioneers like Vint Cerf and Tim Berners-Lee intended the internet to be an open and neutral network, and non-discrimination provisions have governed the, the nation's communications networks since the 1930s. But after intense corporate lobbying, the FCC had pulled the carpet beneath these principles in 2005. So we, we are faced today with a pr rather urgent situation where we need to determine what the future of the internet holds. Will the future be continue, will the internet continue to be user driven and user powered as it was originally intended, or will we increasingly allow this very powerful corporate lobby to pick away at the principles and freedoms that we've had from the beginning? Now, some will argue before you today that the Internet has, has prospered free of regulation. This is a red herring. The Internet has always had a baseline consumer protection written into law. The real question isn't, should we regulate the Internet? Without forward-thinking forward broadband policies, America's economy will suffer. The real question should be, for whom do we create this policy? The phone and cable companies have held Washington policy-making process in their grip for too long, but for all of their talk about deregulation, these giants work aggressively to force through regulations that either protect their market monopolies and duopolies, stifle new entrants and competitive technologies in the marketplace, and increase their control over the content that travels over the web. So we need to act today to protect the open internet as the essential infrastructure of our time. It is the social tool with which we will build a more prosperous, open, and just nation. Free Press is encouraged by the Council of the City of New York efforts to adopt Resolution 712A, it will have far-reaching far implications. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Now we've been joined by Councilmember de Blasio, Councilmember James. I want them both to know that we are streaming and tweeting this, and I hope when you're a public advocate, you can figure out how to do that too. One of my questions would be, and I hope my colleagues will have questions too, um, can you sketch out what ground rules you'd like to see, if any, govern the internet of the future? Because I think we all do want what generally is conceived of as as much opportunity for a vision and um, people who can figure out how to make the world better, which is what I think the internet does for a whole series of people, yeah. I'd like to uh, take on that on. And first, and congratulations to Councilman de Blasio on your new responsibilities. Looking forward to a more consumer-friendly city, continued consumer-friendly city next year. Let me make um, one important distinction that when we talk about net neutrality, we're not talking about regulating the internet. And we think of the internet as all the websites from, from Jonathan Moore's Rowdy Orbit up to Google and Yahoo and everything else. What we're talking about is traditional rules on carriers, on phone companies, and slopping over into cable companies that, as Tim said, have been for, the most, for some degree under regulation for decades. Non-discrimination was a fundamental part of the Communications Act of 1932 for the lawyers in the room, Section 201 and 202. And it's only in the last four years that that's been wiped away. What we want to do is bring back a very basic, simple, conservative, well-established concept of non-discrimination where you can't play favorites online. It's as simple and easy as that. And I think the rules that uh, the FCC has proposed are, are a good way to go. They allow reasonable network management. They allow for uh, cooperation with law enforcement. They allow uh, phone and cable companies to filter out spam for their email customers. So we, the concept of what we want to do is very clear, and there's no reason not to move ahead. OK. Anybody else want to add to that? Yeah. Uh, a lot of people think that net neutrality means that uh, we want to regulate what the uh, carriers can charge for access and in my opinion we should not do that. We should allow a carrier to charge whatever they want um, and compete in the marketplace with the other sources of access to the internet. And uh, if somebody wants a 50 megabit circuit because they want to watch streaming video in HD quality, then you know, that's going to cost more than a dial-up connection, certainly. And I don't believe that we should regulate that side of the internet. And that is how the network operators will make money. They argue that net neutrality will not allow them to make money, but of course that is a specious argument. There's plenty of opportunity for them to make money on the access side. And they should not be allowed to filter or discriminate or in any way stop any application from running on their network as long as it is not a harmful application like a virus or spam or things like that, of course we should filter that out, but any legitimate application like the one that uh, was just described here or, or anything uh, needs to be allowed to operate on the open internet. Okay, thanks. Councilmember James? Just one question. My whole um, career has been built on equal access for all. Um, so to what extent um, will this have on providing access to low-income um, families and individuals in this country? That's a great question. And I think that there are two parts to the answer. The first part is it will have a, um, a great effect in the sense that if you put someone in the middle between the consumer and the user, where there is no one now, someone in the middle that says this website will run faster than that website, you harm the equal access, particularly from the small businessman. And that's from my friend Jonathan, who did this website that I mentioned with you know, the African American and Latino content. He won't be able to get the same customer eyeballs on his site and build his business as somebody who can afford the managed services or other whatever they want to call it that the phone companies put in the middle. So this is very important to maintain the equal access that, as Fred and Tim have said, has been the hallmark of the internet, the characteristic of the internet since we started. And just to add, because I think a part of your question is also about just getting access in communities that are still left off the, the grid. And I, the one argument that has been put forward is that net, new, net neutrality will thwart the necessary investment needed to build out into low-income inner-city communities. Um, and we looked at the numbers 
to see if that was indeed true. And in a study that Free Press released last month, we found in looking at AT&T, AT&T merged with Bell South at the end of 2006, and there, the FCC attached a net neutrality condition to that merger for two years. So we looked at AT&T over those two years and just to see if they indeed, uh, because of net neutrality, curtailed investment. And we found that their capital expenditures actually went up over the two years. And in fact, after the net neutrality conditions expired at the end of 2008, was the only time that we saw that investment in network build-out, network services decrease. So if those numbers tell you anything, it means that net neutrality you know, either has no relationship with network build-out creating access for communities, or if it has any, it's, it's a positive relationship. Um, yeah, I mean, companies do what they want to do. I mean, if you look at Verizon, they're selling off all of northern New England. It has nothing to do with net neutrality. I mean, they're laying off people in Little Rock because of the Altel merger. It has nothing to do with net neutrality. And they build out and improve facilities in neighborhoods, unfortunately, on the whim of what they want to do, because a lot of the, the potential regulatory power to do that has just gone away over the past few years. I mean, in an ideal world, perhaps uh, some years back, a state commission or a federal communications commission could direct a company to say, hey, your facilities are lagging in Harlem or your facilities are lagging downtown. You know, fix it up. And in some cases, years ago, they were able to do that. They can't now. But don't, if they're not doing it now, don't blame it on regulation or potential regulation. Mm. Obviously, I, su I will support any position, any bill um, that will advance access for all as opposed to construct um, barriers. Um, so if um, I will speak with my chair member, my chairwoman, and she will advise me accordingly and I will vote my conscience, but obviously I, I will be led by the leadership of council member Gail Brewer, he, who is the internet guru um, <laughs> in the city council. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one question would be, Obviously, you talked a little bit about the users and the analysis of you could charge more for faster. But what about like a YouTube situation where there's a lot of uh, uh, content? Should they be paying more or not? Again, it's the other side of the coin. YouTube and Google are paying untold millions already. It ain't cheap to put all that video online. And the fact that as former then SBC chairman, then later AT&T chairman after SBC swallowed AT&T, but before the AT&T swallowed Bell South, I have to keep all these straight, chairman Ed Whitaker famously said, you know, these people are using my pipes for free. Now I will note that he started the net neutrality debate before the ink was dry on the, on the first of the series of mergers, so we sort of know where their head is at when it comes to that. Um, YouTube is paying millions. It, nobody's using any pipes for free. As Fred said, as a consumer, I decide what connection I want at my house. Businesses also pay for it. You know, they pay for lots more to put all that video online. So a lot of money is being spent. The earnings are there. And I think for them to say that, you know, somehow folks are taking advantage of, of the Internet and putting up content for free is just another red herring. Well, I, I think the, really the way to think about this is as high bandwidth applications come online, YouTube would be a classic example of a high bandwidth application. Consumers are going to need to increase the amount of bandwidth that they purchase from their carriers. And the carriers can charge more for more bandwidth, and they do charge more for more bandwidth. So I would argue that YouTube is making money for carriers, not costing money for carriers. The, the issue here is that the carriers want to do is they want to control their networks. They want to control who can access the networks and they want to eke out as much profit as possible on those networks. And I think we as a society have an obligation to ourselves and all the citizens not to allow that to happen. And so uh, there is an economic model that has existed for 15 years now on the internet in its commercial phase. It's well understood everybody's making money and the argument that they're going out of business because people are using their pipes for free is in my mind not correct. And something similar of course as cable and phone companies um, should they be per permitted to protect, this is from their perspective, their core businesses by charging content providers or by managing video or voice data, VoIP? Is that something, it's sort of exactly what you were talking about, and I think I know your answer, but I wanted to hear it. Well, I, I, think, that's, I think that's the nut there. In particular, you're looking at these vertically, vertically integrated 
companies that are also in the business of providing cable video services Correct. in addition to high-speed internet. Correct. And what we've seen over the last couple of years as more and more Americans get high-speed connections is that they're taking control of their own media experience. They're creating videos, they're sharing videos, they're downloading them, they're, they're sort of becoming their own media moguls. And turning off the television. And yeah, the, the, there's a term called cutting the cord which terrifies a lot of these legacy companies because they do see a convergence of all things media to a single high-speed internet connection. And unfortunately their solution to that, rather than be building demand to meet the, or supply to meet the increased demand, more people want high-speed internet, they are trying to constrict it in a way that will prohibit people from using video via the internet and turn them back to their legacy products. Now, this sort of this just stifles the sort of innovation that made YouTube such a great revolu revelation for people. So we are very, very strongly against the notion that they should constrict people's use in any way. Let me just add a historical note, since I've been in this business far too long. Um, I started right before the divestiture took effect in 1984. We've seen all this before. This is not new when you talk about discriminating against competing products. I mean, for years and years, um, using telephones that were not manufactured by Western Electric were verboten. Uh, for years and years, using any other services were verboten. It took you know, government lawsuits, it took the FCC to say, yes, you can use other equipment, no, you should not favor your affiliates. So this is, these are things with which the government has dealt for years and can continue to do so in the future, whether it's um, new telephones or whether it's VoIP. You know, I, I would just like to uh, uh, call out attention to the notion that we should protect somebody's business. To me, that is a bad idea. Businesses compete with each other. Times change, technology changes, businesses come and go. The idea that we would protect anybody's business and create regulations to protect any business, to me, is a crazy idea. Let new businesses flourish and let old businesses die. That is the way that we will get the greatest amount of innovation in our society, and that will be the way that we will get more people on the internet, create open access, create more access. Any time we think about protecting any business, we're thinking wrong. And, and following up to Fred, on that, Fred, I think what, you'll, what you're trying to say is that having a stable regulatory environment will spur in, uh, economic development in internet startups. Is that what you're basically stating? I'm not arguing for a regulatory environment that protects anybody, anybody's businesses. We have that in many sense. I think regulations today protect telcos and, and cable companies. It gives them monopolies. And that is not the way to create innovation. What we want to do is create everything we can do to allow hundreds, thousands of competitors out there in the marketplace competing for our business and that will create the greatest set of services for us and society at large. So, so this is what the carriers are trying to do. They are trying to protect their monopolies, protect their profits, and protect their business. And I think we should not allow that to happen. Okay, so net Can I just to take that from a different angle? When the internet started in 1998, we were under common carrier regulation. And one of my great props, which I didn't schlep with me today because it's sort of heavy, is a book I keep on my desk about yay thick of internet service providers from 10 years ago. There were 5,000 of them. I know, I still have mine. Oh, good for you. <laughs> and that's the point that you know, regulation can, in the right environment, foster business and foster creativity by giving everyone an equal chance to play. An, an interesting thing about common carriage is, is also it, common carriage obviously applied originally to transportation and, and then in the communications sector it became, it, it applied to the transport of information. But what common carriage has become in the internet age is really a, a great engine for free speech. And we've talked, we've talked about startups, we've talked about commerce and economic opportunity, but I think it, there's an equal oppor opportunity component to net neutrality which is that it does foster free speech in ways that we've never seen before. In fact, you know, the internet, an open internet, has made the First Amendment a living document for so many people um, over the last two decades that net, and net neutrality and common carriage are the reasons that that stays protected. I want to thank this panel very much for your insights and I really appreciate your being here today, particularly traveling and all of your history on this topic because I know how long it has been. Thank you.